This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So this is a huge topic in and of itself, just as the, um, I mean, Dr. Scheinman covered an amazing amount of material in a relatively short period of time. Um, and so this is quite a, a, a big task. So I've decided, um, in order to not keep everyone here all night, um, just to focus in on the sort of discussion I tend to have with my patients when they first present with atrial fibrillation or we first discover uh, what's going on with atrial fibrillation, focusing primarily on management and what we are doing today. So I'm not really going to talk a lot about cutting edge um, approaches. Happy to discuss those um, in the question and answer period, but I thought um, to make, uh, hopefully, uh, bring the most value to your valuable time to focus on what we really know, what the, what the evidence uh, really is. So Dr. Scheinman fortunately set me up very nicely um, in describing uh, normal conduction uh, from the sinus node through the atria, through the AV node, down to the ventricles, and also explained how atrial fibrillation is this very chaotic, uh, incredibly disorganized conduction and very rapid conduction that occurs in the atrium. The atrium are fibrillating. That, those signals get transmitted through the AV node. Fortunately, the AV node has an inherent uh, protective property here where the atria, if we put a catheter in the atria during atrial fibrillation, we can count that heart rate in the atrium at 400, maybe 500 times a minute, which is not compatible with life. The AV node, fortunately, cannot go that fast. So the AV node essentially says, wait, 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 that's, that's too much for these important ventricles down here. The ventricles are the one that are, ones that are going to contribute to the pulse and really ultimately contribute to the blood pressure. Generally, the AV node can't conduct faster than, depending on your age and, and how much adrenaline you have, 150, 180, rarely 200 beats per minute. So most of the time in atrial fibrillation, the heart rate will likely be elevated, but usually <clears throat> somewhere between 130, 160, uh, but it can be quite variable. But it's usually not imminently life-threatening. Very important to understand that, and it's very important to me to reassure my patients who are very understandably frightened um, when they have these episodes of atrial fibrillation, this is not imminently dangerous. There are things we have to do. It can result in, in some, some pretty significant consequences, maybe can result in death, but those are things that we treat over a long period of time. And I tell them it's kind of like treating diabetes. We need to make sure that your blood sugar is under control because of the things that can happen potentially over usually a, a scale of years and years. So how do we make the diagnosis? It's primarily with the electrocardiogram. So here in sinus rhythm, a normal rhythm, we see these nice P waves, where the, wherever there's an asterisk there, <clears throat> which represents normal conduction through the top chambers, through the atrium. And following each of those is a QRS, which represents the depolarization, the electrical activity occurring in the bottom chamber. In atrial fibrillation, there's not enough coordinated action to give you a nice P value, a P wave. So uh, you don't have any P waves, as we see here. You can't make out any distinct P waves. I should note, you may be looking at, at these deflections, which I'll point out are something called T waves, which are the repolarization of the ventricles. So you notice no clear P waves. It's somewhat rapid, and it's totally irregularly irregular. So we can have things that are regularly irregular. So if you have a repeated early beat, for example, that's not regular, 
but it has a pattern to it. In atrial fibrillation, <clears throat> one of the prime findings is that the heart rate is irregularly irregular. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's completely chaotic. It's important to understand that atrial fibrillation um, can be intermittent, so it can come and go on its own. We call that paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It can be all the time. We call that persistent. An older term is chronic, which we often still sometimes use. And then persistent atrial fibrillation, if we cannot get uh, that rhythm back to normal, is oftentimes referred to as permanent atrial fibrillation. So in terms of the epidemiology, uh, it's extremely common. Um, it's the most common sustained arrhythmia in adults, as Dr. Scheinman mentioned. It affects at least uh, 2.3 million Americans currently. That's probably an underestimate. An important, uh, another very important concept related to atrial fibrillation is that we're, we're appreciating more and more that it uh, can often be asymptomatic um, and wreck havoc because the patient doesn't feel it, doesn't know, uh, and if that rhythm is paroxysmal, they may come into the physician, as, as one of you asked, um, how do we know uh, what they're having? Do they need to have it at the time? They come in to the clinic and they have a normal rhythm. We may not know that they have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It's expected to affect more than 4 million people by 2030. So if you take everyone over age 60, it's about 4%. Uh, if you look at everyone over age 80, it's about 10%. And as you might gather from these numbers, age is a very important risk factor. And in fact, for unclear reasons, the age-adjusted incidence, so even if you take into account the aging of the population, uh, is increasing. So it's something we see all the time. Now you might say, well, who gets this? Uh, and, and we can talk more about why people get this, which is a, a major focus of our research. But there are now very well-established risk factors. So increasing age is extremely important. Being a man, uh, being white, uh, being, having a history of high blood pressure, even if it's treated, a history of heart failure, meaning the lower chambers don't uh, contract uh, strongly, diabetes, coronary artery disease, which means blockages in the blood vessels that supply the heart. There's some evidence, and this is another area of our research, that alcohol, especially alcohol in, um, in uh, excessive amounts, may contribute to the risk of atrial fibrillation. An increased body mass index, or being obese, uh, and then uh, hyperthyroidism, which is a, um, a uh, endocrine uh, or a hormone uh, disorder. Then there are some other kind of special circumstances where we commonly see atrial fibrillation crop up. So one is postoperative, what we call post-op AFib. So it turns out that of um, everyone that has open heart surgery, usually to bypass a vessel, sometimes to repair a heart valve, about 30% of them will develop atrial fibrillation within a few days after that surgery. Um, an extremely high rate, and there is the general thinking is that um, in most of those people, it goes away on its own. Um, it's a little unclear. There's some recent evidence to suggest those people may remain at higher risk longer term. People who have pericarditis, which is an inflammation of the lining surrounding the heart, uh, it occurs um, for unclear reasons, likely related to a viral infection can also bring about atrial fibrillation. And they, those two things may have common mechanisms. There seems to be this relationship between inflammation uh, and atrial fibrillation. And then finally, about 30% of, of patients have what's, what we call lone atrial fibrillation, which means they have none of those, uh, no other heart disease, no other lung disease. They don't have high blood pressure. They don't have diabetes. They can be young, otherwise healthy and it's unclear why they have atrial fibrillation. There is some evidence that those people are more likely to have an inherited form of atrial fibrillation, and we are uh, recognizing now that there is a genetic component to atrial fibrillation. It's a complex one, so it's not that, you know, uh, okay, the dad has atrial fibrillation, then 50% of the kids are gonna have atrial fibrillation. It's much more complex than that, uh, and we're actively, we and many others, actively trying to sort that out uh, and understand that better. So the consequences of this chaotic rhythm that often causes this irregular uh, heartbeat. So number one, you lose the normal atrial contraction. Normally, the atrial contraction helps contribute to the filling of the lower chamber. That's number one. Number two, as I mentioned, usually the lower chambers go too fast. And number three, they are irregular. So all of those things together reduce the filling of the ventricle and likely reduce the output of the ventricle. 
the, or of the normal, the, the, the strong chambers that are pumping the blood to the major organs and to the brain, et cetera. So all of those things can cause a variety of symptoms. As I mentioned, some people feel fine. They don't notice it. Others can just have fatigue. <clears throat> some have shortness of breath. Some just feel a vague sense of discomfort. <clears throat> some notice that their rhythm is beating irregularly and feel a, what, palpitations. Some people can feel a little faint. Then there is this whole other side to this. So that's one uh, in terms of symptoms, which we think more in terms of quality of life. Then in terms of the dangers of atrial fibrillation, we think that that is likely more related to the stagnant blood flow that occurs in the top chambers that are no longer uh, contracting in that kind of normal, robust fashion, which means that blood is not flowing through normally. We know that you know, if you cut yourself and you let that blood pool, it tends to clot. And clots in those chambers, especially in the left atrium where they appear to occur, as I'll discuss in a moment, if they break off and go somewhere else, um, that can cause uh, significant problems. So one of the things uh, we haven't pointed out yet in these um, diagrams is this structure here, which comes off the left atrium, called the left atrial appendage. And if we look with a special ultrasound called a transesophageal echo, so going down the swallowing tube, the esophagus, um, you get a beautiful view of the left atrium because the left atrium, the left upper chamber, is actually behind the right upper chamber. So when you do an ultrasound of the heart, it's very hard to see that back left upper chamber. But if you go down the swallowing tube, you're right next to the left upper chamber. And you can get a nice view of the appendage, which is shown here. And in this case, this person has a very significant clot there. And the major risk factor for this is atrial fibrillation, a, a, attributed to the stagnant blood flow that occurs. So the, the biggest concern about that clot is that it can break off. And in medicine, when something travels from one place in the bloodstream to the other, we call that uh, an embolism, or it's embolizing. Um, so thrombus is another word for clot. So we, we talk about thromboemboli. Those can actually cause, and there's some, the, the data is growing that it's not just stroke, but you can get a heart attack, you might get kidney problems, et cetera. But the main thing we worry about is stroke, likely because the brain is so sensitive to even a very small blood clot traveling to the brain can really have uh, very evident and, and un unfortunately catastrophic consequences. So it turns out that atrial fibrillation is the most common cause of embolic stroke. Um, the rate of stroke in Atrial fibrillation patients in general is about 4.5%, maybe 5% per year. This is in the absence of therapy, which we'll get to. Um, at least 15% of all strokes in the US can be attributed to atrial fibrillation. And again, this is another area where we're appreciating it may be even higher than that. And atrial fibrillation is associated with an increased risk uh, of dying or mortality. Um, up to two times the risk. And that it's thought that that is primarily related to uh, the risk of stroke. So just to uh, frame this in the, in the setting of uh, a patient. So here we have a 50-year-old gentleman <clears throat> with high blood pressure who comes in with some palpitations. And he has this uh, electrocardiogram. And again, we see, boy, it's, it's hard to find a clear P wave. And you look before these big QRSs. Before, you know, uh, that you can see consistently, yeah, there are some squiggles here, but it's hard to make out a clear P wave. And we notice that those QRSs, these, these sharp deflections, don't seem to have a regular pattern to them. They're irregularly irregular, and the diagnosis is atrial fibrillation. So what, so now I'm seeing this patient for the first time. What do we need to do, or, uh, you know, in order to evaluate him thoroughly? And I'm going to refer to the most recent guidelines with, that just came out last year from the American Heart Association and other um, uh, STEAM societies. And it's actually quite simple what you need to do. So we have the EKG. You've diagnosed it by the, by the EKG, sometimes referred to as an ECG. This is an electrocardiogram. The other thing you, do, you should do is a transthoracic, meaning uh, uh, as opposed to transesophageal, which we discussed previously, ultrasound or echocardiogram. And that <clears throat> gives you a nice picture of uh, the pumping action of the heart, the size of the chambers, the valves. You just want to make sure there's not something else underlying that could be responsible or might change your management. And then third, uh, these are a bunch of blood tests. But I will tell you, these are all extremely routine blood tests. So when you go to your doctor, for a regular exam, regular checkup, maybe once a year, and they check their blood work, these are the tests they're checking. 
So thyroid function tests, electrolytes, creatinine, which is a measure of kidney function, hepatic function, uh, uh, enzymes from the liver, and a blood count. Again, very routine. And really, that is all that is needed. Now, obviously, if you find something abnormal on any of those, then you pursue that. But it's not too um, burdensome. And these, this diagnosis can certainly be managed from a clinic. Patients do not need to necessarily come to the ER or be admitted to the hospital because they have atrial fibrillation, assuming they're feeling OK. Uh, if they're not feeling well, uh, that is a different uh, issue. Now, a lot of people ask, well, what, couldn't this be a heart attack? Do I have to make sure I, I, I'm not having a heart attack? And the main uh, uh, lab we check is called the troponin. It's a blood, simple blood test. And you don't need to do that. You do need to do it if you otherwise would suspect a heart attack. So if someone comes in and they say, I'm having really, you know, chest pressure. Whenever I walk 10 feet, I have to sit down because my chest is hurting. That's a different story. But you would, you would um, evaluate that the same way whether or not they had atrial fibrillation. Another uh, question that, for example, medical students and residents will often think of is, oh, a blood clot to the lung can cause atrial fibrillation. Do we need to do a special scan to look at the lungs? And once again, you don't need to do that unless there's some other reason that made you um, suspect that. OK, so the thing that I always, uh, the, the way that I've come to discuss management of atrial fibrillation with my patients <clears throat> is to talk about it in terms of three different goals that are each independent. We have to address them. We address one that doesn't really necessarily help the other two. We have to address them separately. And I'll, I'll go through how we do each of these. So one is to prevent stroke, extremely important. Two, we don't want the lower chambers going fast for a very long time, because that can cause damage to the lower chambers. I'm talking weeks and weeks, if not months, going faster than 110, 120 at rest. Um, those are really the two things that cause damage. And, I, and again, I try to reassure my patients from that standpoint. And there are things we can do to prevent those things. The third is really quality of life. Some people are, I mentioned, are asymptomatic. On the other hand, some people are completely incapacitated by atrial fibrillation. They can't work, um, and they're miserable, and we need to help, help them. Uh, but the reason to do that is just to help them feel better, not, again, to necessarily save their life. So one of the, um, the most basic things to do for atrial fibrillation is to control the heart rate. Uh, and this is, um, if someone comes to the emergency room, that's the first thing that one can do. It's a very straightforward, uh, simple thing. And the way we do that is just to slow that AV node conduction. I described how, fortunately, it already protects the lower chambers, uh, but we can give medicines to slow it even more. And this is often contrasted with rhythm control, meaning we're going to try to get this patient back to normal rhythm and keep them that way. So the question often comes up, should we do rate control, let them be in atrial fibrillation, just control the rate, or try to get them back to a normal rhythm? So there's this very funny and somewhat counterintuitive um, thing that we've learned from good evidence. So one would think, you know, we just talked about how all the horrible things about atrial fibrillation, that normal sinus rhythm has got to be better than atrial fibrillation. The problem is that the means to maintain sinus rhythm are suboptimal. And so there were a bunch of randomized trials that looked at this. So they took patients who had atrial fibrillation and randomized them to a rate control only strategy, let them be in atrial fibrillation, or a rhythm control strategy where they got them back to normal rhythm and then gave them drugs to keep them in a normal rhythm. Uh, an important caveat to all of those studies is that they were really conducted before um, atrial fibrillation ablation became common. And I'll, I'll discuss uh, ablation in a, in a, uh, shortly. The punchline to all of these studies is they found no difference in terms of the hard outcomes that uh, we would care about. So um, specifically, there is no evidence that a rhythm control strategy prevents stroke, prolongs life, or prevents other bad things from happening. Now, there remain a lot of theoretical benefits here. Um, there are many phenomena that have been observed and a lot of animal studies that suggest that the longer someone is in atrial fibrillation, the harder it is to get them out, the more their atrium dilates and probably scars. Um, and many people believe that you should halt that and get them in a normal rhythm, and that's going to help them. The problem is that the randomized trials have yet to clearly demonstrate a, a benefit in terms of prolonged life and stroke uh, from doing that. Now, it's unclear if um, 
these observations are because there's just a problem with the therapies we have. They just don't work that well. Or maybe there's something about the atria in people prone to atrial fibrillation that's going to lead to these other problems, regardless of what we do to their atrial uh, fibrillation. So if we want to control the rate, which we pretty much want to do in everyone, even if we're going to do rhythm control, most atrial fibrillation patients are going to be on some medicine to control their rate. Um, so common ones are beta blockers. So these pretty much all end in alol. So metoprolol, atenolol, propanolol, carvedilol. They all work um, quite well. Um, the other class are calcium channel blockers. The most common are diltiazem and verapamil. These all have different trade names that I, I'm not going to go through now. They tend to all be well tolerated. Different people um, experience taking these differently. They can cause a little bit of fatigue. Both do decrease blood pressure. Now, sometimes that's a good thing, because these patients have high blood pressure. And great, we're going to help control their blood pressure. Sometimes, though, if their blood pressure is low, um, we're limited in terms of how much of these medicines we can give. Another uh, medicine, uh, one of the first medicines used to treat atrial fibrillation is a very old drug um, called digoxin, which is now considered second line, primarily because when one exercises, heart rates can still rise. But it can be useful, especially as an adjunct to these other drugs or if those other drugs aren't tolerated. Now, this comes back to some of the uh, very good questions that were asked earlier. All of these, because they're slowing the heart, can make the heart go too slow. And uh, just to reiterate what Dr. Scheiman described uh, and, and what um, some of you asked about, this tachybrady thing. So especially when someone has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, when they're in atrial fibrillation, they're going too fast, you've got to slow them down. Then the atrial fibrillation stops, and they go back to their normal rhythm. But these drugs, they slow the AV node, but they also slow the sinus node. And as Dr. Scheinman described, oftentimes when there's atrial fibrillation, it's due to some scar or what we call fibrosis. And that process may affect the sinus node such that when they're not in atrial fibrillation, they go a little too slow. And if we've given them these medicines to slow their heart even more, then they go way too slow. And they can pass out or just feel really crummy. And this is where a pacemaker can really come in handy for atrial fibrillation, uh, which, as Dr. Scheinman described, we put in via a vein into the heart. It's important to understand, though, that all a pacemaker can do is prevent the heart from going too slow. A pacemaker uh, or a regular pacemaker does nothing to slow fast heart rates. So it's usually the medicine that slows the heart rate, and then the pacemaker liberates us and enables us to give those rate-slowing uh, medicines. Just some examples of what that can looks like and what, or the generator and what the leads uh, look like. Now, Dr. Scheinman is very famous for pioneering ablation. You know, he talked very modestly about ablation, but Dr. Scheinman performed the first ablation in man here at UCSF uh, in 1982, something like that. <laughs> so the ablation that he and his colleagues performed was to <clears throat> essentially destroy the AV node. And we still do this. It's called an AV node ablation. So people with atrial fibrillation can have different types of ablations. This is a um, fairly straightforward and highly successful procedure where you go in with a catheter and you find the AV node using electrical signals and you burn it. So you, in those cases, you let the patient be in atrial fibrillation. But the ventricles can never go too fast. Um, they, you then have to put in a pacemaker. So this is a good example, again, of pacemaker prevents the heart from going too slow. The nice thing is that the pacemaker gives a regular rhythm, um, and you can control with the pacemaker what the rate is. So this is a very straightforward procedure that has been shown to improve quality of life significantly, generally in people with atrial fibrillation uh, in whom the, the AFib is too fast, uh, where medicines aren't working. Uh, you give them, you pile on those, those medicines I described, and their heart's still going too fast, or for some reason they don't tolerate those medicines. And these days, we would probably generally at least consider a atrial fibrillation ablation uh, uh, burning the, around the pulmonary veins, which again, I'll describe. Um, but that can have some risk. And so especially in older, more frail patients who may not be able to tolerate that, or those in whom we think that procedure is not going to have great success, um, this can be very helpful. Now, what if one decides, OK, I don't want to do rate control. I'm going to do rhythm control. And I want to emphasize that given the results of those randomized trials, um, you might ask why, you know, you just said 
there's no benefit to rhythm control. Um, there's, there are several caveats to that, and, that, and, and the, the main one is that what we now do, or the, the primary rationale for pursuing a normal sinus rhythm strategy is really for quality of life. So you can imagine if, if you were a, a physician enrolling patients in those studies where you know there's a 50% chance they're going to be randomized to rate control, and you have a patient that feels horrible in atrial fibrillation who you can't rate control, you're un, very unlikely to randomize that person um, as a physician who cares about that patient to a 50% chance that they're just going to be miserable for the next few years. So there is a general feeling that in patients who have very symptomatic atrial fibrillation, it's very reasonable to pursue a rhythm control strategy. Um, so really, this is reserved, again, for symptomatic patients in general. And there are a number of medicines that can help suppress the atrial fibrillation. And I show this diagram for a couple of reasons. Please don't worry about all these details. Uh, this is, again, from the most recent guidelines. But I want to show a couple of things. Number one, the type of drug that we give depends on the patient's heart. Do they have other heart disease, especially in the lower chambers? The problem with most of these medicines that suppress atrial fibrillation, they do so by altering those ion channels that Dr. Scheinman so nicely described. And when you alter those ion channels, the problem is you may set things up for other rhythms in the lower chamber that could be dangerous and even life-threatening. <clears throat> so we've come to understand that certain of these medicines can be very safe in otherwise healthy, normal uh, uh, patients with normal, strong ventricles. But in people who have blockages in their arteries or who have weaker uh, ventricles, they can be dangerous. And so they're um, precluded. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is amiodarone, which is probably the most commonly prescribed uh, medicine just in the community in general for atrial fibrillation. It can be a very um, useful drug. It works actually quite well. But it does have a lot of long-term toxicities. So we tend to think of it as second line, especially in younger, otherwise healthy patients, where we like to try, at least in electrophysiology, other medicines first, consider ablation, and if, if those fail or are contraindicated, then we consider uh, amiodarone. Now another um, important uh, part of rhythm control is cardioversion. So this is for people who have persistent atrial fibrillation. If they pop out on their own, um, you can just give them a medicine and hopefully suppress it from, uh, prevent it from coming back. Cardioversion, um, we put a couple pads on, put the patient to sleep, and shock them out of the rhythm. It's a very safe procedure. It works very well um, to get them out of atrial fibrillation. The big limitation here is it does nothing to prevent recurrence. It's just you're giving them that shock at that moment. Um, and it can be difficult to predict if it's a first episode of atrial fibrillation, if you shock them, it may come back in a few days. It may come back a year later. It may come back five years later. There are some things we can use to predict, um, but oftentimes we will also prescribe a medicine to help suppress the atrial fibrillation. Now, ablation, uh, I'll discuss here briefly. In this case, you know, Dr. Scheinman gave you several examples of ablation for SVT, where you have a clear target. We can map the accessory pathway. We can map the scar in AV node reentry tachycardia. We know where to go, and as he explained, the expectation is that the, you're going to cure the patient 95% plus of the time. In atrial fibrillation, and this is kind of a talk in and of itself, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, happy to discuss during the question and answer period. For a variety of reasons, it's been empirically um, observed that if you electrically disconnect the veins that enter into the left atrium from the rest of the atrium, you can prevent atrial fibrillation from recurring in about 60 to 70% of atrial fibrillation patients who are followed for uh, about one year. Um, the success varies depending on a number of things. The most, one of the most important is if it's paroxysmal, the success rate is higher. If it's persistent, the success rate is likely lower. Some centers report um, very high success rates, as high as 90%. Um, those are likely achieved with more than one procedure, um, and I would caution everyone to be a little skeptical if, um, if people are advertising, oh, we can cure atrial fibrillation 90% of the time. I think the more transparent and honest electrophysiologists may quote 60, 70% uh, with, with one procedure. Now, 
This involves going to the left atrium and doing quite a bit of burning. There are new technologies using freezing technology, for example. But usually you're in the left atrium for some time. That blood flow goes to the brain and to the heart. The structure is somewhat thin. So there are risks to this procedure, including narrowing of those veins. Uh, we've learned to avoid that by burning. We, the initial procedures, were the, the burning was done inside the veins, but now we burn outside the veins. There's a risk of stroke because we're um, causing an abnormal surface in that left atrium. We've learned to avoid that by uh, thinning the blood to a pretty significant extent during the procedure. There's a risk of creating other circuits subsequently. And again, we've learned from our experience what ablations to do and what ablations not to do. There's a risk of bleeding outside the heart, uh, which usually we can take care of by putting a catheter under the rib cage and, and draining that. And there's a very rare risk of um, forming a little hole between the left upper chamber and the swallowing tube. I told you how they're right next to each other. And that can actually be lethal. Uh, fortunately, now we know to monitor for that very carefully. And we um, actually put a temperature probe down the swallowing tube. Uh, and so this is fortunately extremely rare. Now, the good news is that it turns out that ablation in patients who have failed at least an anti one of those atrial fibrillation suppressing drugs is much better than trying another drug. Um, trying another drug works maybe 20% of the time in those patients, whereas the ablation, again, can work 60 to 70% of the time. So it's actually quite remarkable how successful this can be, and it really can be life-changing uh, for a lot of patients who are generally very appreciative. It remains unknown if someone has never tried one of those AFib suppressing drugs. It's controversial now. If you have someone who otherwise is a very good candidate, should you think about doing an ablation first? And the evidence is mixed. This was one carefully conducted study that suggested ablation was probably better, but that those antirhythmic drugs can work uh, quite well also. So I want to shift to talking again about stroke and blood thinning, because this is a major uh, area, and there's been a lot of recent developments. I get a lot of questions about this from um, my patients. So this is just an example of an unfortunate patient who, this is a blood clot. This is a <laughs> CT scan where they've taken slices from this image. This is a blood clot in the left atrium. Here, this is an um, image of the brain where you see a blood vessel filling with the contrast that's been injected on this side and you see it's not here on this side. So in this person, this person has had a major stroke, presumed, presumably due to that blood clot. So the way we prevent this, the um, primary strategy is to thin the blood with anticoagulants. Um, warfarin has long been the standard uh, for this. And there are major randomized trials carefully conducted that clearly show that in the right atrial fibrillation patients, meaning those atrial fibrillation patients who have at least a risk factor, some other risk factor for stroke, which we'll discuss, you can significantly reduce the risk of stroke by 50, 60, 70 percent. So you don't reduce it to zero, but you reduce it significantly. Also, patients who have atrial fibrillation and have a stroke on warfarin, those strokes tend to be less severe than those not on warfarin. Um, and also, warfarin has actually been shown to save lives, to reduce mortality in atrial fibrillation patients. I should say that warfarin is the same as Coumadin. Very important to mention that. Um, warfarin or Coumadin is clearly not perfect. It has a lot of problems. The main problem is, because you're thinning the blood, there's a risk of bleeding from about 1 to 2 percent. That in and of itself, usually we can take care of. The thing that really scares us and, and makes us wary of who we're going to give Coumadin or Warfarin to is intracerebral hemorrhage, meaning bleeding in the brain, which is another form of stroke. So we don't want to just trade one stroke for another. And this has been shown to occur in about um, 0.2 to 0.4 percent. Now, there are a lot of problems, a lot of hassle uh, with Warfarin or Coumadin. So it has unpredictable, what we call, pharmacokinetics. So it's hard to know in any given person how potent it's going to be. Therefore, we need to monitor their blood all the time. We need to change the dose frequently. There are a lot of interactions with other drugs that are relevant to treating atrial fibrillation, like digoxin and amiodarone that are commonly prescribed. It also takes several days for it to kick in. And then when you stop it, it takes several days to wear off. That can cause its own problems. And then there are food interactions. So this is the one time that we tell patients, you know, be wary of those green leafy vegetables. Um, it works by suppressing the action of vitamin K on, on constructing clotting factors, essentially. So if someone has a lot of spinach, has a lot of vitamin K in it, that will um, mess up 
the, the effect of warfarin. It's not that patients on warfarin or Coumadin cannot eat green leafy vegetables. It's more that they have to be eaten consistently. And that can, in reality, be difficult to do. So um, a lot of folks have recognized problems with Coumadin or warfarin for a very long time, and so have created these new drugs, which are now uh, in regular use, um, to try to circumvent or, or avoid those problems that I'll describe in a second. There's a, a fourth one called Adoxaban, which has been approved. It's not really mainstream yet. We don't have a large experience with it yet, so I'm going to focus on the three that we're currently using regularly in clinical practice. And you may have heard of some of these, uh, primarily perhaps on TV ads from lawyers um, you know, <laughs> describing problems, which I'll talk about. So, one is called dabigatran, also called Pradaxa. I should say the, ones on the left is the generic name, the, the, the right is the trade name. Uh, Rivaroxaban, which is called Xeralto, and Apixaban, which is called Eliquis. So the nice thing <clears throat> about these medicines, they have predictable pharmacokinetics. So if someone takes a certain dose, you can predict in a, in a, a reliable way what the effect is going to be. Therefore, you don't need to monitor or dose adjust. So that's a huge convenience for our patients. They work pretty much immediately within a couple of hours after taking them. So you don't need to wait several days. And when you stop, they're pretty much out of the system within about a day. And also, there, there, there are some may theoretically food interactions, but they're not at all related to vitamin K. And so we don't really tell our patients that they need to change their diet. So I'm going to go through <clears throat> in very kind of broad strokes how these compare to warfarin. Each of them has been compared in a very rigorous way in huge randomized trials ranging from about 14,000 to 18,000 patients. So these were really very carefully evaluated. Um, the first one was uh, to be approved was dabigatran, again also called Pradaxa, and the, the outcome was stroke. Compared to warfarin, it was found to be better, superior, in terms of preventing stroke. In terms of overall bleeding, it was found to be similar. Bleeding in the head, which again is the bleeding that we really worry about, was better, was significantly less. Bleeding from the gut, which we also worry about, although not as much as bleeding in the head, was actually worse. This occurred more with Pradaxin than with Warfarin. And in terms of looking at mortality, it trended towards being actually superior or less mortality, but was not, that was not statistically significant. Another issue with Dabigatran or Pradaxa is that a, about 10% of people get pretty bad stomach ache. Um, the, the drug itself requires acid to be absorbed, and so it actually has acid in it, the drug itself. There's evidence that if you take a proton pump inhibitor, getting back to the proton pump inhibitor question, <laughs> that that um, actually can help alleviate those symptoms. Rivaroxaban or, or, or Zoralto, <clears throat> in terms of how effective it was, similar to warfarin, at least as good. Overall bleeding, similar. Head bleeding, again, better than warfarin or Coumadin. Uh, bleeding from the gut, again, like Pradaxa, worse. Mortality, very similar to uh, what was found with Pradaxa. Uh, trended towards maybe better, but not statistically significantly better. Uh, the one thing that makes Rivaroxaban different, as well as this new drug, Adoxaban, is that it's a once-a-day pill. These other drugs, Pradaxa and Eliquis, are twice a day. Then finally, Apixaban, also called Eliquis, um, had the best data, frankly. So the effectiveness was similar to better. Overall bleeding was actually better, so less bleeding compared to Coumadin or Warfarin. Head bleeding, again, better. GI bleeding, similar. And mortality was actually better uh, compared to Warfarin. There were subtle differences in the patient populations and the way these trials were conducted. So the manufacturers of you know, the other drugs will, will um, quibble with you about why maybe Eliquis looked better. But the data is what the data is. <clears throat> so in summary, for these novel drugs, the efficacy, the effectiveness compared to our standard of Coumadin or Warfarin appear to, to, appears to be as good or better. <clears throat> the bleeding risk is generally about the same, maybe a little less. There's clearly a lower risk in all three of bleeding strokes or hemorrhagic stroke, which makes us think maybe there's something about Coumadin in particular that increases that risk. Now, a very common and understandable concern about these new drugs is reversibility. Someone gets in a car accident, they come to the ER. Um, we have a long um, history of working with Coumadin. We know how to treat that, what to give. Can these drugs be reversed? And there have been some uh, deaths due to bleeding. Also, as I said, 
the way that Coumadin or warfarin works is by suppressing the creation of clotting factors. So if you just give the clotting factors back, you should be okay. Whereas these drugs block the action of the clotting factors. So there's been a lot of question as to whether giving clotting factors back would work. This slide is pretty complicated, but it's essentially to tell you about this one study um, that was done comparing dabigatran or pradaxa to uh, rivaroxaban or Zeralto, where they took healthy volunteers, gave them one of those blood thinning drugs, drew some blood, and checked a blood test to see how thin the blood was. They then gave this combination of clotting factors back. And through a repeat blood test, it appears that the rivaroxaban or Zeralto could be inhibited, whereas the Pradaxa or um, Dabigatran could not. So it suggests maybe Dabigatran or Pradaxa would be a little harder to reverse than Zeralto. We are developing a, um, uh, an experience working with these drugs, even doing procedures on these drugs. And it does appear that especially Zeralto and Eliquis or Rivaroxaban and Apixaban can likely be reversed um, with our normal um, uh, clotting factors that we have available. All of these companies are actively working on reversal agents that I suspect will be available in the next year or two. So what about those scary ads on TV that are motivated by you know, uh, litigation? So there's no question. There's a risk of bleeding with these. These are thinning the blood. Um, so people are going to be at higher risk of bleeding. But when they are indicated, the risk of not taking them far exceeds the risk of bleeding. There's a risk of bleeding, but there's a reason they're prescribed. So if you think about it, if a patient comes to the emergency room bleeding to death because they, their warfarin level's too high, no one's going to call a newspaper, and no one, probably no one's going to call a lawyer. But with these new drugs, someone comes in, they're bleeding, oh, they're on that new drug, someone, you know, call, alert the presses. So there's a bit of a bias in terms of hearing about this bad news. And to steal a quote from a, a senior investigator who worked on these uh, studies named Mike Ziekowitz, as he said, Patients don't call you in the middle of the night to thank you for not having a stroke, right? And that's, and there's many more strokes prevented. Again, in the patients that are indicated, many more strokes prevented than uh, bad things happening to the patients on these drugs. So this is an example of a real world experience where they looked at a Danish registry, about 12,000 patients. Um, this is, I'm sorry, a little hard to see. But they looked at the people who got Pradaxa, and they looked at the people that got Warfarin. And if you take this line, on this side of the line, this is Pradaxa's better. On this side of the line, Warfarin's better. So this is real world experience. This one, and, and anything that doesn't cross that line is statistically significant. So this is death. Death was less with Pradaxa than with Coumadin. This is heart attack is less. This is clots to the lungs. This is bleeding in the brain. These are all less. There was nothing that was better with Coumadin. Okay? And again, we know clearly that people with atrial fibrillation that have risk factors do better with Coumadin. So I think it's safe to extrapolate from this that if your physician recommends one of these anticoagulants and you have atrial fibrillation, you should take them. The, there's, a, there's clear evidence that these drugs are um, under-prescribed by far. And there are probably a lot of preventable strokes and probably a lot of preventable deaths because the appropriate patients are not taking these drugs. Now, as I mentioned, we do have to think about when we consider, as a responsible physician, does this atrial fibrillation patient need a blood thinner? We do have to look at their other risk factors. So we use this scoring system called the CHADS-2 or the CHADS-VASC uh, that include things like age, uh, whether they've had a history of high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure. Being a woman increases the risk of stroke in the setting of atrial fibrillation a little bit more, whether they've had any sort of vascular disease. And the more of these you have, the higher the risk um, of stroke. And we know uh, from studies that if the risk is zero, so a person who is younger than 65 and doesn't have any of those risk factors I mentioned, um, the risk of blood thinning is thought to be too great to uh, merit starting it. So in those patients, we generally say don't need to take anything, maybe a baby aspirin. In patients who have two or more of those risk factors, it's clear that giving a blood thinner, the benefit far outweighs the risk. There are some cases where if there's just one, um, then there's, there is some clinical judgment there, and it kind of depends on what that risk factor is. Very rarely if there's two. I should also say that Eliquis, because the risk of bleeding is quite low, 
there's some question, even in these low-risk patients, whether it might be beneficial. So coming back to those three independent goals, we want to prevent stroke. And in general, the way to do that is anticoagulation. One of the more cutting-edge things I, I haven't spent time on, I'm not planning on spending time on it unless there are questions about it, are these new devices to prevent stroke, which are um, really brand new. One was just FDA approved, but we don't have a great experience uh, with it yet in real life uh, medicine. Um, two, we want to prevent the heart from going too fast for a prolonged period of time, and that's where either adequate rate control or rhythm control comes in. And then three, we want to help with quality of life, and that's primarily where we, we think about these drugs, these antiarrhythmic drugs that suppress the atrial fibrillation. We think about cardioversion to shock the heart out of atrial fibrillation or ablation. And then I just want to close with a few slides about a study called the Healthy Heart Study um, that we are conducting here at UCSF, which is internet-based. And I mention it here because I know you're all you know, clearly interested and, and like to, to think about these things and, and understand these things, and we do as well. Um, and we also understand that contributing to research can sometimes be inconvenient. So we constructed this to be an ideally a convenient way to contribute meaningfully to research from your own home or from your smartphone. The other premise of this is that smartphones are very powerful tools. So 91% of smartphone owners keep their smartphones within three feet 24 hours a day. So you can imagine, wow, you could, there's probably a lot of data that we could use for meaningful research from those phones. And, and most people now in the US are connected to the internet. So when one enrolls, and I will say that the enrollment criteria are very simple. Age greater than 18, equal or greater than to 18, and uh, internet access. That's it. And we have uh, about 20, 25,000 patients now worldwide. I think I have a slide on that in just a second. We want healthy people. We want people with heart disease. Um, we're taking all comers. And part of it is to take a series of surveys. And we try to make it engaging, interesting, simple to use uh, to collect um, real data. So this is our enrollment. Hopefully, you can see this OK. Um, we have at least now uh, 16 people from every state in the US. We also have about 110 countries um, where there we have participants. So if you want to contribute to heart uh, research or know someone who does, you can just Google Healthy Heart Study or Healthy Heart Study UCSF, and it should come up. Uh, this is the link. We do have a special emphasis. So there are three principal investigators. I'm one. Um, another is Jeff Olgan. Uh, and the third is Mark Pletcher. Both Jeff and I are electrophysiologists, so we are especially interested in arrhythmias. And it just so happens Jeff and I, our research interest has primarily been in atrial fibrillation. So we're trying to do things that previous cohort studies um, have not done in terms of really understanding uh, atrial fibrillation. And there are a lot of really special opportunities to, to study atrial fibrillation uh, with the Healthy Heart Study. And with that, I'll conclude and take your questions. Thank you. Yeah, very good question. So the question, and very relevant, um, the question is commenting on damage that can occur uh, from pacing uh, 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 the heart. So we, it's just come to light within the last 10 years or so that pacing the ventricle in particular, and specifically the right ventricle, which is where we put most of our pacers, can in some people, and we still don't completely understand what proportion of people, um, lead to a weakening of the heart. And the, the thought is that because the, the left ventricle, the, the one that really pumps blood to most of the body, is not being activated through the normal conduction system where it squeezes in a very efficient way, but instead is being kind of activated from the right side and then the left side in a disorganized fashion, that that turns on a series of signal, signals that then feed back and cause what we call remodeling of the heart, which can actually make it weaker and weaker. Um, so there, uh, that's led to several things. So one is when we put in a pacemaker, uh, in the US, usually we put one in the upper chamber and one in the bottom chamber. Um, if someone's in atrial fibrillation all the time and they're not getting out of atrial fibrillation, we just put it in the bottom chamber. Um, most pacemakers are put in because the heart rate is too slow above. There's not a problem between the atrium and the ventricle. And we can get away with just pacing the atrium. So whenever we can, if we need to pace, we just pace the atrium, and we have the, pace, uh, the lead in the right ventricle just as a safety measure. Now, some people, we have to pace in the right ventri ventricle because um, there's a blockage there. Um, there is a special pacemaker, and this may be covered in another talk, uh, 
called a biventricular pacemaker that we put in to patients who have a weak heart and a problem with their conduction system such that their heart con um, contracts in this dyssynchronous way. In those patients, we put a pacemaker into the right ventricle and then, a, a, I should say, a lead into the right ventricle and another lead into a vein that wraps around the left side and we pace the right and left near simultaneously to resynchronize the heart. What, we, what the current standard is, and this is a little controversial, if someone has a, norm, a, a heart that is of normal strength and they need a pacemaker and we know they're gonna pace on the right side, most people will just put a, a right-sided pacer in. Most of those patients will not suffer any negative consequences from that. <clears throat> if, however, their left ventricle is weak at all or they have a history of a weak ventricle, we think, oh, this person may be prone to developing a weakening of the heart. So now the standard is we should put in a biventricular pacer in, that, in those patients to avoid the dyssynchrony and hopefully keep their heart synchronous. Great question. So the question is whether those uh, TV ads influence patients and their decisions. Um, I think they do. Um, it's actually something that I think is a um, very interesting research project to, to quantify that. Um, I, to my knowledge, that research has not been done, but from my personal experience, I encounter this all the time. That, oh, I don't want to take that. I saw, you know, there, people are dying from, from these. And much of what I told you is the same spiel I give those patients and talk about, you know, uh, you don't get called in the middle of the night for the patient that didn't have a stroke. Um, ultimately, of course, it's the patient's choice. Um, I try to inform them my best I can. Most of the time, I think um, those that are uh, skeptical, I'm able to sway, but I have had some people who uh, come in with that and, and, re and did require a little bit of convincing, and I've had a, a few who refused to take them because of those ads. Hmm. So the cost effectiveness, the question is regarding the cost effectiveness of the technologies that we use, and you're referring to ablation as well as devices. Um, so it depends a little bit on the device or the ablation. The evidence generally um, fa does not, the, well, I should say, it doesn't appear that the cost um, is much greater for those procedures or those devices. In many cases, the, it's cost saving. Um, so going back to what Dr. Scheiman um, demonstrated, there are some studies, we have another study coming out, that show if you do an ablation for SVT, you can really prevent a lot of ambulance lot rides, a lot of ER visits, and it very quickly becomes cost saving. Pacemakers, same thing. You know, patients aren't falling and hitting their skull and staying in the ICU for days on end. Instead, they get a pacemaker. So uh, atrial fibrillation, ablation, even though it's 60 to 70% successful, appears to also be cost effective because in many of those patients, again, you're preventing visits to the ER, visit, at the ER and, and hospital. Question is, <clears throat> for patients uh, maintained on drugs for the atrial fibrillation, over time, uh, to suppress the atrial fibrillation, over time, does that effectiveness wear off? Um, I would say that's highly variable. There is this um, puzzling phenomena where some people do really well for a few years and then they have breakthrough, uh, breakthrough episodes of atrial fibrillation despite this drug that previously was working for them. Why that happens, I don't think we know. Um, and that's an indication then for ablation or at least to consider ablation. Also in those patients, sometimes you can switch the drug and this new drug, even though we think the mechanism is similar, works whereas the first one didn't. If, however, you are, um, I've had patients who, uh, who I inherited from other physicians that have been on the same drug for decades and have had no AFib on those drugs. So if you're doing well on that drug, I, I would say there's not an indication for ablation. That, there's not, a, there's not uh, an indication to prophylactically ablate because you expect that the, the effectiveness will wear off. Yes, so if, <clears throat> the question was, if atrial fibrillation's been there for a long time, is the ablation felt to be um, less effective? Yes. So we make a distinction. We talked about uh, paroxysmal comes and goes on its own, meaning very short episodes, versus persistent. And persistent, the success rate is less. Even among persistents, we, we make a distinction between someone who's been in atrial fibrillation for the last three months, we think of very differently than someone who's been in for more than a year. And the experience is that those who have been in for more than a year or five years versus a year, the, the longer it's been present, the lower the success is likely to be. As I think I mentioned, atrial fibrillation 
contributes to, well, there are a couple of reasons why that may be. One is that we think it contributes to adverse remodeling. The atria get larger, they get more scarred. And it's also clear that the larger the atria, the lower the success rate, the more scar there is, the lower the success rate. The other is that maybe there's something about that person's atrial fibrillation. You know, why has that person's atrial fibrillation been persistent, whereas this person's was paroxysmal? Somehow this one was stopping on its own. This one did not. Um, and what I think we're coming to appreciate is that atrial fibrillation is kind of a final, final common pathway of many different mechanisms. It's kind of like cancer, um, where we say we're going to beat cancer, but then you realize, you know, this um, leukemia is completely different than this breast cancer. These are completely different diseases. We just call them both cancer. And then maybe the atrial fibrillation is similar. Um, and we just need, and the, the optimal therapy may differ because the underlying mechanism is likely different for those different people. So, That's a very important question. I'm glad you asked that, actually, because it's a common question. What pulse rate is too low? Um, I would generally say that we don't tend to worry about the number. What we worry about is how you are feeling. So, you know, marathon runners, when they're at rest, their heart rate may be in the 30s. I mean, especially when they sleep, it may go down to the 20s. Um, so it really depends on how you feel. Some people's heart rates are in the 40s and the 50s. They feel fine. They get up. They walk around. If they feel fine when they get up and walk around, probably their heart rate's going faster than, than that. If they get up and walk around, they feel dizzy or they're fatigued. When they exercise, their heart rate can't go faster than 55, 60. That's, a, that's an issue. Um, but I wouldn't worry about the pulse per se. Um, I would also say you know, it works on the other end, where we see patients, and it's, it's commonly in, in healthcare workers, actually, who I think have heard normal heart rate is between 60 and 100. And these are often young, healthy women um, this, is the, the note, this is the epidemiology, um, who develop what some people call inappropriate sinus tachycardia syndrome, meaning their heart rates are a little fast. And there may be a bunch of reasons for that. But one that I've observed is that they notice that their heart rate's a little faster than 100, especially when they get around. And they have been told in their class, normal heart rate, 60 to 100. And they get very anxious about that. And then their heart rate goes up. And then they check their pulse, and they get even more anxious. And so, so I try not to worry too much about the number and concentrate more on how one feels. Yeah, so another great question. So how do we handle it when someone develops bleeding from one of these blood thinners, and yet they're at risk for stroke? Um, so there are a couple of, there are several approaches. <clears throat> so one, it depends on the severity of the bleeding. Sometimes it's minor. We continue it. It doesn't come back. No problem. Sometimes that is a sign that there's a problem. There's an ulcer, and that ulcer needs to be treated, or there's some other lesion that is bleeding that needs to be treated. There are some people where, unfortunately, they're just prone to bleeding, and they, or they have a bleed in the brain. That's the, that's the big one, where they're at risk for stroke, and then they bleed in the brain, or they're bleeding from the gut. There's nothing to fix. Then what do you do? Then you're stuck. So uh, one approach that has yet to be rigorously studied, but that we do here at UCSF, is uh, an approach developed by a colleague of Dr. Scheinman and I named Dr. Randy Lee, who's another electrophysiologist, working with a company called Centra Heart, where they go in um, from the outside of the heart and from the inside and essentially tie off the left atrial appendage with the idea that we think most clots form there. And if you could tie it off and seal it off, maybe you can prevent strokes. So that's what we're doing. Um, there is another um, company now owned by Boston Scientific, a, a device called the Watchman, where you go in from the inside and you occlude the left atrial appendage. Um, that one, you may still need some blood thinning for some time to let that kind of heal over. Um, but theoretically, over time, you might be able to stop blood thinning. And that's going to become probably more and more common. Thank you. Thank you.